If you're a child of the 90s, odds are you were watching Sabrina the Teenage Witch. A massive hit upon its debut, it brought the Archie Comics character to TVs around the world. Sabrina Spellman would work her magic on screen for seven seasons and spawn a massive merchandise empire. The story of Sabrina starts several decades before her 1996 debut, though. We have to go back to 1962, when Sabrina first appeared in Archie's Madhouse No. 22, an anthology series featuring several short stories in each issue. Created by writer George Gladier and artist Dan DiCarlo, Sabrina was originally meant to be a one-off character, though she proved popular enough with audiences to be brought back several times. Joining her in her first appearance was her cat, Salem Saberhagen, and she was later joined in her adventures by Aunts Hilda and Zelda. Funnily enough, Sabrina's Aunt Hilda actually predates Sabrina by several months. Hilda the Witch debuted in Archie's Madhouse No. 19, featured in her own stories, and introducing others, kind of like a host for the comic. Hilda's relationship to Sabrina was established in Archie's Madhouse No. 37. Sabrina's Aunt Zelda wouldn't come along until issue No. 65. Sabrina, while popular enough to be a recurring character in the series, wasn't a massive hit. She wasn't even popular enough to headline her own comic. But her profile got a boost from a TV witch who appeared a few years after Sabrina's comic debut. Bewitched, which began airing in 1964, starred Elizabeth Montgomery as Samantha the Witch, who fell in love with an ad executive named Darren, played by Dick York, and then later Dick Sargent. The series followed Samantha's adventures through several seasons as she tried to play a typical suburban housewife while also being a witch. It had this very stylish animated opening sequence, the sort that would suggest this show would make a great cartoon. Around the same time, The Archie Show was airing on CBS, produced by a company called Filmation. The series was a massive hit for the studio, and they wanted to branch out in creating more animation, so they started eyeing other popular properties they could adapt. Bewitched seemed like a perfect fit, but unfortunately for Filmation, they couldn't get a hold of the rights to that series. But when the head of daytime programming at CBS happened upon an old Archie comic featuring Sabrina the Teenage Witch, it was suggested that Sabrina be put in the spotlight instead. Back in the comics, Sabrina had had her own self-contained adventures, but in the cartoons, they decided to bring her into the Archie Comedy Hour to hang out with the Riverdale crew. She was even featured in the 1969 single from the Archies, Sugar Sugar. Take care of the kissing booth while we're singing, Sabrina! She also got some time in the spotlight in the Archie and his new pals TV special. Sabrina was then given her own comic series called Archie's TV Laugh Out, where she was integrated into the Riverdale world in the comics as well. And in 1971, Sabrina would be starring in her own animated series, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Sabrina the Teenage Witch. She finally got her own ongoing series, also titled Sabrina the Teenage Witch. The animated shows played a big role in fleshing out Sabrina's universe, introducing the characters of Harvey and her cousin Ambrose, although Ambrose wouldn't be appearing in the 90s sitcom. As the decades rolled on, Sabrina's popularity and Archie comics in general started to fade, with the animated shows coming to an end in the late 1970s and Sabrina's regular monthly comic series coming to an end in 1983. The whole idea of a teenage witch had faded from public consciousness and was reduced to stuff like this. Stop that! Unreal! You can try to, you blue! I will make a fool of you! Stop that! But Sabrina wasn't ready to be forgotten just yet, thanks to a rising young star. Melissa Joan Hart started acting at an early age, starring in a number of commercials in the 1980s. She even performed in a production of The Crucible on Broadway, starring Martin Sheen. But her big break would be starring in the Nickelodeon TV series, Clarissa Explains It All. Melissa's mother, Paula Hart, wasn't too pleased with the roles being offered to her daughter while she was working on Clarissa Explains It All, so she decided to take charge of her daughter's career and find her next project for her starting a production company in 1993 alongside Melissa, who was 17 at the time. This company would be called Heartbreak Films. Clarissa Explains It All ran for five seasons, ending in 1994, and it was around this time that Melissa Joan Hart was ready to move on to her next project. According to Paula Hart, she was handed an annual Halloween comic that featured Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and she thought it was the perfect role for Melissa. She then negotiated with Archie Comics for the rights to pitch Sabrina and some of her supporting cast to various production companies. She got the rights for a single dollar. While this might seem like a bargain, in reality I'm sure Archie Comics was getting a cut of the money after the fact, and the dollar was exchanged as a legal necessity to prove that Paula Hart had indeed purchased the rights to pitch these characters. This tour of pitching the idea eventually brought Paula Hart to Showtime where Sabrina would take to the screen in a TV movie. Although it did star Melissa Joan Hart, 
nearly everything else about this movie was different from what most fans of Sabrina the Teenage Witch would recognize. Set in Riverdale, we see Sabrina Sawyer find out she's a witch on her 16th birthday. Her serious Aunt Hilda, played by Sherry Miller, and her silly Aunt Zelda, played by Charlene Furnettes, help guide her through the process, with a few assists from the cat Salem, voiced by Brian Steele. In the movie, Salem was put into the body of a cat because he used his magic to win a mortal woman's heart. And this is where the idea of Salem talking at all came from. Before this, Salem could only meow like a cat. At her school, Sabrina is friends with Marnie, played by Michelle Baudouin, and Harvey, played by Tobias Meller. Sabrina is tormented by the cheerleader Katie, played by Lalina Lindbjerg, while pining for the cute school football star Seth, played by Ryan Reynolds. Yes, that Ryan Reynolds, complete with a very 90s hairstyle. You know, I'm really kind of thirsty. Oh, you know what? Me too. Uh, get me a root beer, would you? The story plays out like most teen movies where Sabrina gets into a lot of mischief before realizing that it's not Seth she should be pursuing, but Harvey. The movie featured some decent mid-90s TV movie level special effects, and it also established a few visual elements that would become iconic in the TV series, such as Sabrina changing in front of the mirror with a few finger points or floating above her bed. The movie also features some really bad photo edits on its VHS cover. Sabrina the Teenage Witch proved to be a huge success for Showtime, becoming the highest rated family movie ever on the channel. While putting the movie together, Paula Hart kept trying to convince the people around her to turn this idea into a series. When the movie was completed, she took the initiative to edit together a three-minute trailer on her own, using footage from the movie. She went to several networks with the trailer in hand, and of the five she spoke to, three of them immediately offered to pick it up as a series. Paula went with ABC when they offered a spot in their coveted TGIF lineup. The family-friendly block of programming was a perfect fit for the new Sabrina the Teenage Witch TV series. A witch can turn every person into a toad that misses the premiere of her new TGIF show. Okay, just kidding. The change from movie to sitcom was pretty dramatic. Melissa Joan Hart would reprise the role of Sabrina, though her last name would be Spellman now, as it was in the comics. Michelle Baudouin returned as her best friend, though her character was now named Jenny and not Marnie. Every other role was recast or eliminated, though. Zelda and Hilda had their personalities swapped. Katie became Libby, and Seth was dropped entirely. The location also switched from Riverdale to Westbridge, Massachusetts. The Sabrina Spellman we meet in the sitcom is a charming overachiever, constantly getting into trouble because of her misguided attempts to use magic to solve her problems. When reflecting on the differences between Sabrina and her last major role, Clarissa, Melissa Joan Hart remarked how she thought Sabrina would be more relatable, saying, Clarissa was, oh, I want to be like that. Sabrina is, oh, she's just like me. Libby can't hurt you. She's just one person with a crazy story. She's a cheerleader. Nobody has more credibility. <laughs> Caroline Ray was cast as Sabrina's Aunt Hilda. Although originally reading for Zelda, the longtime stand-up was a more natural fit for Sabrina's wackier aunt. Originally, Caroline Ray wasn't too interested in the idea of doing a series, though having just gone through a bad breakup, she was tickled at the idea of playing a character who had the power to trap her ex inside a ring. The fun-loving Hilda often got in nearly as much trouble as Sabrina and would decide on a whim to change her life entirely, whether that meant giving up the violin or buying a coffee shop. I sent you a half a pot roast? That just means he's gonna be a little late. Oh, he's so thoughtful. Sabrina's Aunt Zelda would be played by Beth Broderick, a veteran of film and television. She brought a grounded sense of maturity to Sabrina's more intellectual aunt. Before Broderick was cast, there was some talk of Cecily Tyson for the part of Aunt Zelda. Nell Scoville, who developed Sabrina the Teenage Witch for television, turned down the idea as Caroline Ray was already the favorite for Hilda, and she wanted to make sure that the two aunts would look like they were related. Though Scoville's agent did argue, it's a world of magic. Maybe one sister is black. Ultimately, the part went to Broderick, who became synonymous with the scientifically gifted Aunt Zelda. Always the picture of confidence working at her laptop or teaching at a local university. There's a lecture at MIT on the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. It's either at 8 or at 10. Harvey Kinkle would be played by Nate Richard, a relative newcomer to the world of acting. This role would be his first major recurring part. Harvey was Sabrina's first real crush in the TV series, and unlike the nerdy version of the movie, this Harvey is a second-string football player who doesn't always have the best of grades. His trusty nature also made him a bit more naive towards Sabrina's more risky uses of magic. But I still have to ask my aunts. Just tell them what I told my parents. It's an astrology field trip. Don't you mean astronomy? Wow, they're paying even less attention than I thought. Joining the cast from the movie, Michelle Baudouin played Jenny Kelly. 
Whereas Marnie was a bit muted in the movie, Jenny would be slightly more eclectic, an outsider in the school, though not in the traditional nerd sense. As Sabrina's first friend, Jenny offers some guidance to the world of Westbridge High. You should know I have these two really weird aunts. But I like weird. I love weird. I bask in the glow of weird. I you know, I think Jenny will fit right in. The last student in Westbridge is Sabrina's nemesis, Libby Chesler, played by Jenna Lee Green. What won Green the role was that during the casting of all the actresses to come in to play the cheer squad bully, only Green did it with a smile. It's that perfect blend of joy and her cruelty that made Libby the perfect person to hate. She could immediately tell there was something off with Sabrina, and Libby would make sure that Sabrina would never forget it. Don't come in here again. From now on, you use the freak's bathroom. <laughs> Paul Feig played Mr. Poole, a teacher at Westbridge and the last human member of the principal cast. Although he would go on to be best known for helping create the series Freaks and Geeks and directing movies including Bride's Maze and the 2016 version of Ghostbusters, back in 1996, Feig was primarily an actor. Mr. Poole is the often exasperated and sometimes surly science teacher. Although happy to foster a love of science in any eager student, he's a bit jaded after many years trying to survive as a public educator. All right. I'm ready for you, little weevil. Come closer. Come a little closer. Suck potpourri and die! Ah! The last member of the cast, and perhaps most important, is Salem Saberhagen, voiced by Nick Bakai. Although Bakai had originally been hired on the show as a writer, his performance while reading the script during auditions was deemed so good that they decided to give him the role. Appearing on screen as a puppet of questionable quality in the first season, and then more passable later on, the puppeteers who controlled Salem were Tom Fountain, Jim Greenall, and Maury Bernstein. Salem was also played by a collection of actual cats whenever he needed to be seen performing an action. The names of these cats have mostly been lost to time, but the few I was able to recover include Elvis, Lucy, Warlock, Witch, and one who was actually named Salem. Depending on who you ask, there were as many as 9 or 12 cats playing Salem throughout the show's seven seasons. Salem is an American short hair. I'm darn proud of it. Write that down. The judges will eat that up. Sorry. Salem is an American short hair and darn proud of it. In his former life, he was a witch sentenced to 100 years in the body of a cat after attempting to take over the world. He became a fan favorite as the series went on because of his silly charm and uncanny fashion sense. I can't go dancing. I can't play squash. The sound of the can opener is the only thing that makes me feel truly alive. Salem, would you like your rubber mouse? Please. Although this would make up the principal cast for the series in its first season, the only two members who would remain as part of the cast throughout the show's entire seven season run would be Sabrina and Salem. I'll keep track of who comes and goes from the show as we go along, but by the end of its run, 18 different actors would, at some point, be part of the show's principal cast. The series also hosted a number of high-profile guest stars, from stars of the past like Dick Van Dyke and Barbara Eden, to more recent stars such as George Went and Randy Travis, to stars of the future including Usher and Avril Lavigne. Watching the series is always surprising to see who shows up in a random episode. You'll be watching Sabrina and her friends go through a wacky adventure and all of a sudden, there's Brian Cranston. Ahead of Sabrina the Teenage Witch's premiere, there was a modest amount of hype for the series, though it was the TV series version of Clueless, which also premiered on the same night as part of TGIF, that had a massive push behind it. But when Sabrina debuted on September 27th, 1996, it took America by storm and proved to be a breakout hit. The first episode of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Pilot, has a similar premise to the TV movie. Sabrina has just turned 16 and is showing signs of becoming a witch. You see, there are two realms, the natural and the supernatural. And it turns out that the immutable laws of You're a witch! Sabrina's witch father is incredibly busy, so Sabrina has been left in the care of her aunts. I suppose my mom's a witch too? I always thought so. Actually, your mom's mortal. You see, that's why you're here, so that we can teach you to use your magic. The absence of Sabrina's mother represents a double standard that series creator Nell Scovel had to fight against behind the scenes. In her book, Just the Funny Barts, Scovel describes how she was brought into the series after the original showrunner was suddenly unavailable, and Scovel made several changes to the pilot's script. Originally, Sabrina's mother was going to have died in childbirth, but instead of killing her, Scovel thought they could just send her away to be an archaeologist in Peru. 
The people from Viacom, the production company behind the series, fought back on this. They thought if Sabrina's mom was absent, it would look like she abandoned her daughter. Oddly enough, they were completely fine with Sabrina's dad being absent, though. Ultimately, Scoville got her way, and Sabrina's mother was left alive and in Peru. Similarly, the head of ABC wanted more conflict in the pilot, and suggested having Hilda not be happy Sabrina was living with them. Scoville pushed back on that too, thinking it would be too sad for Sabrina to have her parents missing and having to live with an aunt that doesn't want her. What these changes represent is a perspective this series takes towards female characters in general. Sabrina's mother is allowed to be a professional woman with an exciting career, rather than a plot device. And neither of Sabrina's aunts fall into the wicked, uncaring, adopted mother figure. In both instances, it allows the women in Sabrina's family to be more present and caring for her, even if, in her mother's case, she can't be with her physically. Being alive in Peru is a lot closer than being dead. In the first episode, we learn a bit more about Sabrina's world, such as the linen closet being a portal to the other realm where witches live. Now, make a left of the towels and follow the signs. And watch out for Drell! And whatever you do, don't stare at his mole! Sorry, is this the Witches' Council? Sabrina travels to the other realm to confront the Witches' Council, a group that governs the rules of being a witch. Although the council would take many shapes over the years, in this episode they're played by magicians Penn and Teller and Sigurd Deborah Harry from the band Blondie. Originally, there was a fourth member of the Witches' Council in this scene, a character named Mr. X. The actor who played him, even without any lines, caused so much chaos with his outbursts ahead of filming that he was cut entirely from the scene and fired from the show. That actor was Rudy Summers, the six-month-old son of series creator Nell Scoville. Rudy did get a chance to redeem himself in a later episode, though, when he played the role of Cupid in the opening credits. Happy Valentine's Day! Watch out for Cupid! The pilot episode establishes an interesting tension that often manifests itself throughout the series, particularly in these early seasons, taking something that has the reputation of old, mystical roots and mixing it with modern sensibilities, basically bringing witchcraft into the modern world. We can see an example in this joke here. The only way to make this better would be to turn back time, and you said a witch can't do that. A witch can't, but collectively we do have powers that a single witch doesn't. It's a union thing. Which is working collectively to make a powerful change, being paired with the idea of a union, is very cute, and a subtle hint at the occasional themes seen in the series. The episode ends with Sabrina getting the chance to make up for her bad day at school and embracing the fact that she's going to be the weird kid, albeit one who has some fun with magic. The jocks think I'm cool? Oh, and I'm going to the movies with Harvey and Jenny Saturday night? Woohoo! I'm normal! Gotta go tell the cat! Everything is established very quickly in this early episode. Sabrina and Harvey are just starting to get into each other, Libby is mean, and the consequences for magic are established while keeping their fun, chaotic side. Because of its use of special effects, episodes of Sabrina the Teenage Witch were filmed on a set without an audience over the course of a few days, so the only laughter heard on the show comes from a laugh track. Although it should be mentioned that, even though the show has an ample supply of jokes, the use of the laugh track is surprisingly restrained for a 90s sitcom, at least in its first season. An early review for the series noted its potential as a small hit, noting Melissa Joan Hart's acting in particular. It mentioned that Sabrina the Teenage Witch ranked first in the ratings for kids ages 2 to 11 that night. Though that wasn't its only ratings win. Not only did Sabrina the Teenage Witch's ratings outdo the other TGIF freshman series, Clueless, it also performed better than Boy Meets World and Family Matters, making it the top show of the night for ABC. Over 17 million people tuned in that Friday, and that rating success would continue for the rest of the season. Nell Scoville describes the series in her book saying, Being a teenager means coming into your powers, but being an adult means learning to control them. This would be true through much of the series in its earlier episodes, though that metaphor of power meant a lot more than Sabrina being able to turn things into pineapples. Witches have historically been symbols for feminine power, although magical powers were never real, in the preceding centuries the persecution of witches was less about punishing genuine sorceresses and more about punishing women who deviated from social norms, often leaving them further marginalized in a society that tended to treat women as second-class citizens. Being set in Massachusetts, Sabrina the Teenage Witch is keenly aware of this history, and rather than lean into a more negative depiction of witches and witchcraft, making Sabrina some kind of malevolent force, this sitcom instead is more empowering and creates a sympathetic witch and witch world. Sabrina the Teenage Witch not only featured a largely female cast, it was also driven creatively by women in a number of leading roles behind the scenes. There was a lot of feminine energy behind this show. Sabrina's magic and her magical world have a very feminine quality to it. While there are certainly male witches in the series, Sabrina's story is about a girl coming to terms with her powers, and the influences she feels most strongly are the women in her life. 
In Sabrina Through the Looking Glass, Sabrina has a rough day when she notices a wart on her forehead, a physical change all witches go through. I am not going to school like this. You can't skip school because of a wart. It's part of being a witch. It happens to all of us. I once had one on the end of my nose for a decade. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't that funny. I wanted to die. This change puts Sabrina in a bad mood and is a not-so-subtle metaphor for Sabrina getting her period, which signals her journey into womanhood, something made even more apparent when we see her reading a copy of Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar at lunch. The Bell Jar, three puddings. This can't be good. It's not. Sabrina learns how to manage her stress, and with some help from her aunts, she's able to fix the mess she made when she called down a blizzard and turned Libby into a goat. This shows us that Sabrina's journey into adulthood will be managed by two strong female influences, using their centuries of experience to guide her. One of the real strengths of Hilda and Zelda as role models is how full they feel as characters. They often go on their own adventures and have lived very rich lives. We can see an example of that in the episode The Great Mistake, where we see them argue about things they borrowed from each other over the centuries. I want it all back. That how many so centuries like can you, you go on being be irresponsible and inconsiderate? A market! The episode also gives us several flashbacks of Hilda and Zelda in their earlier days. I wasn't doing anything. You always go for the cheap laugh. I do not. It's I just that time of your pathetic attempts to try and get attention. Now can I get back to my abacus? Sabrina's aunts get more hands-on with helping Sabrina when they become teens so they can chaperone their niece in the episode Hilda and Zelda, The Teenage Years. Now remember, you're my extremely shy cousins, Hilda and Zelda. Wait. No one would name their kids that, okay? You're Hillary and you're Zellery. Zellery? Yeah, your parents were hippies. The show isn't quite so basic as to present female characters as uniformly good influences. In Third Aunt from the Sun, Sabrina's Aunt Vesta, played by Raquel Welch, tries to take Sabrina from Hilda and Zelda, tempting her niece with the various attractions in The Pleasure Dome. Look, a puppy! Isn't he cute? Gradually, though, Sabrina loses interest in staying there. Sabrina, you can't go. I'll be... So lonely without you. Well, you can come stay with Hilda and Zelda and me. Maybe I'll just get that puppy back. The example of Vesta is interesting in that it shows Sabrina a version of womanhood that isn't right for her, even if it might be a good fit for Vesta. Vesta, along with Hilda and Zelda, represent a range of experiences for Sabrina to model herself after, not becoming a clone of one, but instead taking what she likes best for herself from each of them, whether it's Zelda's love of science or Hilda's spontaneity or learning how not to live for pleasure like Vesta. Although my favorite example, and where Sabrina probably got her sweetness, is revealed in the episode, A Halloween Story. Zelda and Hilda give Sabrina a gift certificate to spend 30 minutes with a person who's passed away. Instead of choosing James Dean as she's initially considering, Sabrina chooses someone else who's had more of an impact on her life. Sabrina. Granny. Oh. Granny, there's something I want to tell you, only, well, it's kind of strange. Well, Sabrina, you know you can always tell me anything. I'm a witch. Well, dear, as long as you're happy. Sabrina's mortal grandmother's unquestioning acceptance of her and her grandmother's kind words reinforces the power of bonds these women share. Nell Scovel, in her book, wrote, Never denying the power of sisterhood turned out to be a key to our success. The historical marginalization of women and their stories is very much felt in the episode The Crucible, where we see Sabrina and her friends go to Salem, Massachusetts, and end up recreating the Salem Witch Trials. Sabrina's teacher, Mrs. Lecht, played by Berlinda Tolbert, gives the students special cards letting them know who will be playing a townsperson and who, secretly amongst them, will be a witch. Libby uses this scenario to her advantage to frame Jenny as a witch when she suspects Jenny is getting too close to Adam, a boy Libby likes. Libby! What's wrong? She did this to me. Jenny Spector flew in through the window and braided my hair. Why? To make me look dorky. When Sabrina tries to stand by her friend, Libby accuses her of being a witch too. She has a witch card! Sabrina is a witch! <gasps> it's interesting how Sabrina's show of solidarity is what gets her outed as a witch. It even leads to Sabrina standing up for witches. Well, maybe you fear witches because you've never met any. Yes, witches are different from mortals, but different isn't bad. I mean, maybe there are witches among us right now, but we're so closed-minded they can't tell us who they are. And we're the ones missing out. 
Because if we just accepted witches, maybe there'd be a big pizza party right now. So I ask you, can we accept witches? No! Sabrina constantly has to downplay what she can do in order for her to be accepted into the mortal world. And to survive in a world that won't let her be her true self, she needs a friend like Jenny to support her, so she supports Jenny back. In this sense, being a witch is a metaphor for female power and solidarity, the power to change the world in ways society might not expect, and the sisterhood that binds women together. Libby, as the cheerleader who rules the school with an iron fist, upholds the power structure that holds down witches who might dare to live outside of it. She's a tool of the system, thriving off the power it gives her, and an example of how female strength can be co-opted and used against other women. Sabrina doesn't try to make Libby her enemy, it's Libby who picks this fight, because she senses the threat of Sabrina, who isn't interested in conforming to the rules of high school. By the end of the episode, Mrs. Lecht reveals the truth about the game. So, who did have the witch cards? No one had the witch card. Every single card said townsperson. I didn't create the witches. You did. The witch trials are presented as a historical curiosity here, an aberration that reveals how paranoia can destroy a community, and that we should never fall into that mental trap again. It's a neat little twist that says something about paranoia, but it works on another level too. Mrs. Lecht is wrong in so far that she thinks she's just talking about the past. Sabrina is living proof that there really are witches, and there was a literal witch trial in this episode. In the same way, feminine power such as Sabrina needs to be hidden because society just isn't ready for it. Otherwise, the witch trials would resume, and the mortals would never let Sabrina live a life of peace. With one mortal being an exception. It would be a crime not to talk about Sabrina and Harvey. The crush that blossoms into a first love is a major highlight of the first season. Here's a moment in the episode, Dream Date, where Sabrina freezes Harvey in time so she can tell him some things. It's great that we're friends, but sometimes I wish it were more. I like you, Harvey. I like you a lot, but I guess for now, this is the closest I can get to saying it to your face. And Harvey feels something similar. I like you, Sabrina. Why can't I say it to her face? Aren't they adorable? Teenage romances are tough to pull off convincingly. Most of the time it gets reduced to hormones as a teen sees another teen they think is hot, and the story becomes about how they try to contrive a date of some kind, usually with some jerk getting in the middle of all of it. A good romance takes the extra step of showing us why these two are so good together. Since Sabrina is the star of the series, and she's pretty and likable, it's not tough to figure out why a teenage boy would be into her. But Harvey could have been a very different character. He could have easily been a cute boy to be fond over at a distance, and not a whole lot more than that. By making him friends with Sabrina, we get a better look at their chemistry and we start to understand why they would be into each other, like this cute moment in the episode, First Kiss. My valentine started out just as big as yours, but I kept trying to make it even and it got smaller and smaller. But I love it, it's very symmetrical. See, that's what I was going for. I love symmetry. Things just look nicer that way. Like your face. It's really symmetrical. Harvey's line about Sabrina's symmetrical face shouldn't work, but for them it does. Harvey's a bit of a goof sometimes, but he genuinely cares about Sabrina and respects her decisions, like when she refuses to kiss him after finding out the first mortal she kisses will be turned into a toad. Maybe I'm reading too much into this, but yesterday I got the feeling that you wanted to kiss me, and today I feel like you don't. No, Harvey, it's just... See, I... I can't explain. That's all right, you don't have to. I mean, if that's what you want, we can just be friends. Sabrina can't resist such a sweet guy, so she kisses him and he gets turned into a frog. The only way to turn Harvey back is if their love is true, so Sabrina goes to the other realm to prove her love of Harvey through a series of challenges, all through the context of a cheesy game show. Harvey number three, what's your favorite kind of triangle? Equilateral. I like that it's symmetrical. That's him! Sabrina passes all three tests. Harvey is restored to his human form through the power of true love, and Zelda ends the episodes with a few poignant thoughts. There was no risk. I knew she'd pass. You did? At 16, it's always true love. Why didn't you tell her? Because now, she thinks it's extra special. If this hasn't gotten too unbearably cute for you, there's also a sweet moment where Harvey is smitten with a cat he doesn't realize is actually Sabrina under a spell. No, Harvey, she's not for sale. Are you sure? She's the sweetest, most beautiful cat I've ever held. As far as couples go, they're pretty adorable. In the episode As Westbridge Turns, their relationship is symbolized by a gift Harvey gifts to Sabrina. 12.36? That's what time it was when we first spoke. In the cafeteria, on your first day at school. 
This little memento is the perfect picture of a teenage romance, overly romanticized and awkwardly modern, just the sort of thing you'd see one 16-year-old give to another. Harvey represents the opportunity of acceptance in the mortal world, but he's one boy, and one that seems very naive. Although he comes close to learning the truth about Sabrina several times, Harvey never quite connects the dots, or it's undone by magic when he does. The secret between them is an obstacle in their relationship, and it represents the larger social problem of which is not being welcome in the mortal world. But there's the hope that, if Harvey could be the exception, maybe there'll be a day when the mortal world will be like him, ready to accept witches and not leap at the opportunity to persecute them. The rest of the series would wrestle with this dynamic, though never quite the way it did in the first season. Although the series had plenty of more bright spots ahead, it's apparent that a new showrunner, in this case, Miriam Trogdon, stepped in after this season when Nell Scoville chose to leave the series for personal reasons. And over time, the showrunner on Sabrina the Teenage Witch would change again. Throughout the seasons, there would be several shakeups to the cast, with the characters Jenny and Mr. Poole exiting the series after the first season. Melissa Joan Hart was asked about this years later, and she gave an answer that could be a catch-all for the many casting changes we would see throughout the years. Season by season, our show's cast would come and go based on audience reaction, and sometimes there'd be disputes about contracts and negotiations as far as payment goes for certain actors, and just bringing in a fresh perspective from a different character. Also, there's a lot of politics that go on behind the scenes, like when a writer develops a certain character, they get paid on the likeness of that character for every episode. If a writer develops a character, but that writer's gone and there's bad blood, they might get rid of the character they developed, so they didn't have to pay them anymore. There are a lot of things that go into that situation. This did create some openings for new characters, and luckily for the series, a few inspired choices were yet to come. A few less flattering things should be addressed from season one, such as the tendency to dress Sabrina and her aunts in odd outfits. It seemed like every time they wanted Sabrina to do something with a bit of international flair, it came with dressing up as a stereotype. One episode in particular, Sweet and Sour Victory, stands out. In this episode, Sabrina gives herself the ability to kick ass at a martial arts tournament, and it has some of the most ridiculous Asian stereotypes I've seen in a while. It even has the tournament start off with a gong. Now, excuse me, Harvey, I've got to go kick some butt. To be fair to this episode, it does push back against stereotypes at least a little when Sabrina's opponent, Tai Waitse, played by Kari Hiroyuki Tagawa, is revealed to be more than a cliché. But this is a small positive in a sea of negatives. This might reflect something the show's creator mentions in her book when she notes how overwhelmingly white the production was. She wrote, I had the opportunity to include more voices, and I didn't make enough of an effort. That was a mistake. It would have made the show funnier. It makes me wonder, had an Asian writer been in that writer's room, maybe they might have asked the question, is the gong maybe a little too much? It would be absolutely criminal if I didn't mention one more bright spot in season one though, and that's the utter delight of seeing Salem driving a car. There will be plenty more cute things Salem does throughout the series, and it's only responsible for a serious analyst like myself to highlight when they made the kitty do something cute. Let them eat cake, but save me some. The first season of Sabrina the Teenage Witch was a massive hit, particularly with kids. And with that came the sweet plum of merchandise. A lot of stuff was created to capitalize on Sabrina's popularity. There were novels, companion books, a soundtrack, video games, trading cards, dolls, and lots of other stuff for kids to buy. Someone is calling. Sabrina Psychic Phone. A real phone that tells you you're getting a call. Meow. Before it even rings. Hey, Brad. Sabrina also made a return to comic books with a new ongoing series featuring Melissa Joan Hart on several covers. These stories wouldn't be adaptations of the series, but rather set in the ongoing Archie world that Sabrina had found herself in before she was cancelled back in the 1980s. One fun twist of these comics is that while Hilda and Zelda used to look like this, they were given a makeover to match the more modern vibe of the series, without copying the likenesses of Caroline Ray and Beth Broderick. Sabrina also got a cartoon, titled Sabrina the Animated Series. There would be a number of cartoons based on Sabrina the Teenage Witch throughout the years, after her profile was raised by the 90s sitcom, but this one had the closest connection to the live-action series. Melissa Joan Hart voiced both Aunt Hilda and Zelda, and her younger sister Emily voiced Sabrina. Sabrina! Spooky sounds are supposed to inspire the potion making! You want me to be inspired? Tell me I'm done. Nick Bakai also reprised his role of Salem. In the series, Sabrina was 12 years old, so not quite a teenage witch. It ran for 65 episodes on UPN and occasionally on ABC. After it ended, there would be a TV movie, Sabrina Friends Forever, and a sequel series, Sabrina's Secret Life, but many of the actors would be recast. Sabrina turned 13 in the movie and 14 in the second series. 
a witch hitter. Sabrina's 17th birthday brought with it the introduction of several new characters. Joining the principal cast was Lindsay Sloan, playing Sabrina's new best friend, Valerie Burkhead. Sloan was familiar to the cast before joining, as she had been working on the short-lived series Mr. Rhodes, which was filming nearby. She and Nate Richard were even dating at the time. Valerie is in the same shoes Sabrina was in last season, being the new kid at Westbridge High, although without magical powers and not nearly as much confidence as Sabrina. Sabrina, you might want to know you're having a Halloween party. What? Well, I would have said it was going to be at my house, but I was afraid my parents would dance. Another new cast member was Alamy Ballard as Albert the Quizmaster. Before coming to the show, Ballard had played the role Frankie Hubbard on over 200 episodes of the soap opera Loving, later renamed The City. With Sabrina turning 17, she was expected to get her witch's license, and the Quizmaster gives her a series of challenges to test her, often at awkward times. Quizmaster had a fashion style that can only be described as uniquely 90s. Degrees here in downtown Westbridge, let us greet the day with the brother's chunk. Ow! <laughs> Who are you? Your quiz master, please don't hit. The last person to join the principal cast in season two was Martin Mole as vice principal Willard Kraft. A veteran at this point, Mole had a long career on television, going back to Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Before Sabrina, he had spent nearly 50 episodes on Roseanne as Leon Karp. Mr. Kraft is the incredibly strict administrator of Westbridge High, who is particularly suspicious of Sabrina although he would be more susceptible to the charms of both Hilda and Zelda throughout the series. He's also just kind of a jerk. I am Vice Principal Kraft, just like the cheese. <coughs> Loser. And I heard that. Although not joining the principal cast, I should mention Mary Gross, who joined the series as Mrs. Quick, appearing in 21 episodes over the next three seasons. Another clear indication of it being season two is the upgraded appearance of Salem, looking a lot more cat-like with this significantly better looking puppet. Seasons 2 and 3 both have a season-long premise to mix things up. For Season 2, it's Sabrina being tested by the Quizmaster for her witch's license. In Season 3, it's a series of family members who appear in episodes to give Sabrina clues about the family secret, the last thing she needs to know to use her new license. The first season introduces us to Sabrina as she takes her first steps into becoming an adult witch, providing lots of character-building episodes. Seasons 2 and 3 start to focus on Sabrina's adventures in the wider world. It's not a complete transformation, but there is a noticeable difference. As a starting point, let's look at the Season 2 episode, Five Easy Pieces of Libby. This is a very Season 1-esque episode where Sabrina and Libby are assigned to work on a float together for the school's Democracy Day. When Sabrina casts a spell to keep Libby at a distance, the Quizmaster reverses it. Instead of Libby staying away from you, you have to stay next to Libby. What? And if you do happen to move more than five paces away, something terrible will happen. When Libby is turned into a giant puzzle, Sabrina has to hunt down a few rogue pieces, and in the process learns that there's more to her bully than she first realized. This is the one that came from her grandmother's picture. I know where this goes. Her heart. It reminds me a little of Sabrina's relationship with her grandmother, and though Sabrina can't reveal how she found out about Libby's softer side, they do connect over it in a small way. It's just that I wanted to get done this weekend so I could uh, visit my grandma. Oh. Well, I would hate for part of the float to look like you did it. It's a nice moment that humanizes Libby while showing Sabrina that one of her more underrated powers is being able to muster up some empathy for someone like Libby. Episodes like this weren't as common in seasons 2 and 3. On the other hand, we were more likely to see different types of episodes that tended to focus less on the inner lives of characters and more on the hijinks they got up to, like season 3's A River of Candy Corn Runs Through It, where Sabrina's Halloween party spirals, going from a complete dud to an awesome disaster. While both the Libby episode and the Halloween episode are entertaining in their own right, the journey through seasons 2 and 3 start to favor the hijinks episodes a lot more than the character ones. Here are a few quick examples of more hijinks. In Nobody Knows Libby Like Sabrina Knows Libby, we see Sabrina shrink down and fly into Libby's brain on a spaceship. Nostril at 12 o'clock! It's flared! <laughs> And in Sabrina's pen pal, Sabrina finds out her other realm friend is a jewel thief. Take the stone. Save me from myself. See? You aren't all bad. I knew I was a good judge of people. Mm -hmm. 
Now I have your magic. See ya. <laughs> well, I'm really glad no one else was here to see that. Shows where characters get up to mischief or fall victim to it are pretty common in sitcoms, mostly because these types of episodes are very popular. Sabrina the Teenage Witch, with its use of magical powers, made it particularly adept at handling spectacle and absurdity without it seeming completely out of place. But without the balance of character-driven stories, the messaging of its earliest episodes gets a bit lost as the show starts playing towards a broader crowd. That isn't to say there was no moral to any of these stories, just that the episodes tended to place a greater emphasis on the spectacle. I don't think it's a coincidence that the show's popularity might have influenced it to attempting to be more broad to hold on to that wide audience. It's in seasons 2 and 3 that The Other Realm starts to feel more fleshed out. More residents of that space were introduced, and more institutions were revealed, such as the need for witches to have a license. In the season 2 premiere, Sabrina Gets Her License, parts 1 and 2, we see Sabrina reprimanded for failing a test and getting sent to witch camp. The more we see of The Other Realm, the more we get a sense to how similar it is to our world. Nighty nights! Ladies. Just doesn't sound as me when they really are ladies. <laughs> In My Nightmare the Car, when Hilda and Zelda are having issues with their magic budget in the mortal realm, they have to check in with their accountant. Zelda, Hilda, what's up? It really bothers me that I don't find this weird. And when magic goes awry in the episode Finger Lickin' Flu, people are treated by a magic doctor. Wow, it does feel better. I invented this device. Yes, and he named it the Wicked Cool Drainy Thing. <laughs> While a lot of these trips to the other realm are fun, it also makes that space feel a bit more mundane, as if they're taking their cues from the mortal realm more so than the opposite. While bringing witches into the modern world has always been a big part of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, going right back to the comics, we see less of strange places like the Pleasure Dome Aunt Vesta lived in, and more places like a magical doctor's office. We also see a subtle change to witchcraft and how it needs to be wielded responsibly. While in the first season, Sabrina was very much presented as a novice who couldn't control her magic, her growth is starting to look less about finding that control and more about learning the various rules she has to live under. In the episode, Whose So-Called Life Is It Anyway?, we get a rundown of what those rules look like. They're advising witches under the age of 21 to refrain from charitable magic. Whew, relieved of the burden of helping others. Charitable magic can have disastrous long-term consequences. Okay, I'll add that to my list of 10,000 other witch rules I'm supposed to follow. When you hear all those rules, it makes the witch's magic sound bad. Or at least that the magic witches use to help people aren't part of some kind of fated plan for the mortal world, and that witches just shouldn't be a part of it. Or at least not in a way that'll make a difference. Whereas the early episodes of the series ask the question whether the mortal world would ever accept witches or not, these episodes are raising the idea that the mortal world would actually be right to reject them. While Sabrina's magic can bring her closer to a nemesis like Libby, we more often see her turn the lives of mortals completely upside down. In the first season, you could chalk that up to Sabrina simply being inexperienced. In later ones, it seems as though she just simply shouldn't be using magic at all. The number of times magic gets used on Harvey, Libby, or Mr. Craft is ridiculous. And while they have their flaws, it hardly seems fair that they get to be toys for witches to play with. The only type of magic that ever seems acceptable for Sabrina to use is magic that creates minor conveniences, like changing her clothes quickly. All the rules are understandable when Sabrina is learning how to use her powers, limits establish boundaries for safe growth. But to find out that she shouldn't be using them in a meaningful way at all, that's a less charitable position for a force that stands as a metaphor for feminine power. In the 2004 book Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body, and Primitive Accumulation by Silvia Federici, she outlines how the rise of capitalism necessitated marginalizing the role of women in society, forcing them into narrow roles where they would be responsible for producing laborers for the machine of industry. Women who lived outside of these roles, often older and living in poverty, would be victims of witch hunts. This reveals how the persecution of these women, with tens of thousands being killed for being witches, was not simply a product of religious fervor, but instead a means of controlling women and curtailing feminine power that could not be exploited by a patriarchal capitalist framework. Witches have long been symbols of resistance in feminist movements, like in the 60s with the Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell, or witch. Various spiritual groups practicing under Wicca can also be considered a rejection of more patriarchal forms of spiritual life. So when we see a witch like Sabrina reading a feminist novel by Sylvia Plath, it's not a coincidence. Sabrina the Teenage Witch, as a production started by and starring women, uses the symbols of a witch and magic to tell a story of female empowerment. But when magic, and by extension female empowerment, begins to be reined in, 
all while the show is starting to explode in popularity and make some serious money, it reveals how, rather than a symbol of rebellion, this witch is being co-opted by the systems it once symbolically resisted. That it's more important for Sabrina to appeal to a wide audience with her hijinks so the show can make a lot of money, rather than risk alienating some of them with her appeals to sisterhood and female solidarity. There is an interesting season 3 episode called Sabrina's Real World that seems aware of this show's desire for spectacle when Salem signs a deal with an other realm TV producer to put Sabrina's life on television against her will. When Sabrina realizes she's being used so Salem can live the high life, she tries to be boring so that she can get the show cancelled. So they start throwing some ridiculous twists at her. Dinosaur! What language do giant lizards speak? Of course, Japanese. <laughs> Toyota no I didn't know Sabrina could speak Japanese. Oh yes, it's part of every safety monitor's training. <laughs> it's a nice encapsulation of what's happening on the show itself. Sabrina talking to a French dinosaur honestly isn't that weird when we've already seen her do some other wacky things before. But the show is telling us that this is what producers want done on a program to keep audiences engaged. It makes you wonder how many of the spectacles we had seen up to this point were being requested from the top. Interestingly, the way Sabrina gets out of this conundrum is when Zelda steps in and convinces the producer to replace Sabrina's show with some of Hilda's stand-up. Hilda is wearing a magical belt that forces her to tell a million jokes. What's Aunt Hilda doing in my time slot? Well, I paid a little visit to your TV producer. My outfit made him kind of nervous, so he made me a deal. The solution to Sabrina being exploited by TV executives is female solidarity. So not everything about this show's early episodes has been lost. Another thing lost from season 1, although not lost for good, was Sabrina's relationship with Harvey. They both decide to stop dating each other when Harvey's dad and Sabrina's aunt suggest they see other people. According to my father, my goals are pass math, start at least one football game, get a part-time job, and date other girls. Date other girls? Sabrina, we know Harvey's father is a colossal boob. But we agree with him on this one. What? I can't believe you're taking his side. You're young. You should try new things, meet new people, have lots of wonderful experiences. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> While I understand giving Sabrina the chance to go on dating adventures opens the door to more story opportunities, this seems like an odd way to end what is otherwise a happy romance. Though maybe my guardians were just more hands-off than Sabrina's or Harvey's. The show doesn't give up on Harvey and Sabrina entirely, though as we still see glimpses of their affection for one another in several episodes. In Sabrina and the Beanstalk, we get a cute episode where Sabrina is tasked with rescuing Harvey when the Wicked Witch, played by Shelley Long, captures him. She's gonna cook you! See? Monday, Hansel. Tuesday, Gretel. Wednesday, Har <laughs> Harvey. Let's get out of here! In Rumor Mill, when Sabrina befriends another half-mortal witch, Dashiell Calzone, played by Donald Faison, she starts to fall for him. Friends? Are you kidding? You just saved me and my quiz master. <laughs> Sabrina eventually has to make a decision between Dashiell and Harvey in the season 3 premiere. It's a mad, 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 mad season opener at the school's Grease-themed dance. Will you go study with me again? Really? I'd love to. Sabrina and Harvey stay together for the rest of the third season. But not everything would last until season 4 as there would be a number of departures. The quiz master had already said his goodbye at the end of season 2 in the episode Mom vs. Magic. This is a thankless job. <laughs> and in season 3's silent movie, we say goodbye to both Libby and Valerie. I'm selling my kidney on eBay. <laughs> While Jenny and Mr. Poole both vanished without being mentioned again, these exits at least had some explanation in the series. The Quizmaster's job was done when Sabrina passed her tests, Libby was sent to a boarding school, and Valerie's family moved to Alaska. The third season drew to a close with Sabrina finally figuring out the family secret in the episode The Good, The Bad, and The Luau. That's it! Every member of the Spellman family is born with a twin! A twin? Congratulations, Sabrina! <laughs> you solved the family secret! This might have had more of an impact had we not already seen Sabrina meet a mirror version of herself in an earlier episode. And it certainly wouldn't be the last time we'd be seeing Melissa Joan Hart play two identical characters on this show. Katrina is revealed to be Sabrina's evil twin when she tries to throw Sabrina into a volcano, so Katrina is sent to the Twin Cities where evil witches are kept. 
The finale here is interesting in that, in some ways, it embodies the duality of Sabrina as both resistance to, and a tool of, dominant power structures, though the good and evil are not so clear-cut in the series itself. The second and third season mark a moment where Sabrina the Teenage Witch is at something of a crossroads for itself. Does it maintain its message of sisterhood, or does it lean more into the spectacle of its magical escapades? But before we answer that question, here's a clip of Salem wearing a shower cap. I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> Sabrina the Teenage Witch had proven so successful that ABC renewed it for two more seasons in the middle of its second, and they were asking for more than just new episodes. They also asked for a TV movie featuring Sabrina. Behind the scenes, Melissa Joan Hart was not too keen on playing Sabrina all year round and was hoping for a break. When speaking to her mother about the project, Melissa mentioned her love of the Audrey Hepburn movie, Roman Holiday, and wanting to work on something like that. This gave Paula Hart the idea to turn this movie into Sabrina Goes to Rome so Melissa Joan Hart could play her Audrey Hepburn fantasy of traveling through the streets of Rome, while upholding her commitment to a Sabrina TV movie. Sabrina Goes to Rome aired after the first few episodes of season 3, but seems to have taken place before that season started. The only characters we see from the series are Sabrina and Salem, with a whole new cast accompanying them on their trip to Rome. The reason Sabrina's in Rome is because she needs to open a special locket she got from her father to help her aunt Sophia, who's trapped inside of it. To do that, she has to unravel some mysteries of betrayal and travel through time, and it's all very convoluted. As Sabrina travels through Rome, she's joined by another witch, Gwen, played by Tara Strong, at the time going by Tara Cherendoff. Sabrina also falls for a photographer named Paul, played by Eddie Mills, who is trying to capture Sabrina on film so he could get rich, but he gives that up when he's charmed by her. This does raise the question of, what about Harvey? Or possibly Dashiell, depending on when this took place. But this movie is so self-contained that it's never really referenced again, outside of another TV movie that followed this one in the next year. Due to the success of Sabrina Goes to Rome, ABC wanted another movie. Since Melissa Joan Hart wanted to learn how to scuba dive with her friends in the summer, they sent her to Australia with Tara Strong and Lindsay Sloan to make Sabrina Down Under. Although Strong would reprise her role as Gwen, Sloan wouldn't be playing Valerie, but instead a mermaid named Finn. And mermaids are what this movie is all about, as Sabrina and Gwen befriend Finn's brother, Barnaby, played by Scott Michelson, who's turned into a human for 48 hours. This wasn't quite a gender swap of The Little Mermaid, though, as Sabrina ends up rejecting Barnaby's advances because she's got a guy back home. Do you have someone back home you do that with? Yeah, I do. Well, he's very lucky. <laughs> Thanks. If you're wondering why all these mermaids are swimming around Australia, that's because the premise for this movie is that a marine biologist, Dr. Julian Martin, played by Peter O'Brien, is trying to protect the Great Barrier Reef from the harms of pollution. But when he learns that mermaids are real, he instead tries to uncover them for a chance at fame. I have to say, it was pretty gutsy making the conservationist marine biologist the villain of the movie. I guess it says something about how people can be blighted by fame. The movie also features some of the worst CG I've seen in a while. I know it's a TV movie from 1998, but this moment where Sabrina is hit by lightning is way funnier than it was probably intended to be. I don't know what you're so worried! Ah! Sabrina! A cute subplot was that Salem, who comes along for the ride again, falls in love with another witch who's been turned into a cat, Hilary Hexton, played by Rebecca Gibney. Of course, with a face like this, how could she possibly say no? Sadly, things don't end up happily for Salem. This trip was to celebrate the end of my sentence. It expired today. I don't have to be a cat anymore. These TV movies are a bit tough to square with the series. They both aired around the time a new season was debuting, but they feature Sabrina completely removed from the circumstances of the show. They also seem like an excuse to put Sabrina in a novel location for a little bit with some new characters. While it was probably intended to freshen up the character, it left me feeling a little homesick to see Sabrina back with her regular cast of characters. The movies reveal that Melissa Joan Hart had a lot of power behind the scenes, being not just the star of the show, but also its producer, as it was because of her that they changed their shooting locations entirely. But Melissa Joan Hart wasn't completely above controversy. In late 1999, she appeared on a cover of Maxim magazine, where she was wearing a lot less than we were used to seeing her in. According to Melissa Joan Hart, in her book, Melissa Explains It All, she describes how the people at Archie Comics were so upset by this cover that they were threatening to get her and her mother fired from the show for letting this happen. Prior to this, Archie Comics had largely been hands-off with the show, only making minor requests, like asking that Sabrina wear a seatbelt while in a car, or that when crossing a street, she should be using a crosswalk. And Melissa Joan Hart had previously appeared on the cover of Details magazine in her underwear, 
According to Hart in her book, what really rankled the people at Archie was that the cover read, Sabrina, your favorite witch without a stitch. Melissa Joan Hart responded to their concerns with an apology letter written by her lawyer. They accepted and life moved on for the series and its star. Sabrina finally hits 18 in the fourth season, and that birthday brings some more new members to the show's principal cast. The first is Brad Alcero, played by John Huertas. Previously, he had appeared in the movie Why Do Fools Fall in Love, playing singer Joe Negroni. Brad is Harvey's old friend, and to Sabrina's alarm, Brad has a special witch hunter gene that can turn Sabrina into a mouse if he discovers she's a witch. Hey, so you excited to be back in Westbridge? Must be great to know everyone missed you so Yeah, so whatever. The next new cast member is Dreama, played by China Shavers. This was Shavers' first recurring role after a series of guest appearances on other programs. Dreama is an accident-prone witch in training who Sabrina has agreed to mentor. I got you a present. <laughs> oh dear, that was supposed to be flowers. By 1999, Sabrina the Teenage Witch had established itself as a hit show. It debuted the new season with a brand new intro and had enough pull to get a guest appearance from Britney Spears. I was supposed to go to this Britney Spears concert and- Say no more! So Melissa Joan Hart had recently appeared in the music video for You Drive Me Crazy, a Britney Spears song featured prominently in Melissa's new movie called Drive Me Crazy. It says something about the direction of this show that its season 4 premiere ends with a music video from a guest star that's also selling a movie from a show star. What you're getting isn't just a fun episode of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, you're also getting ads for an album and a movie. This is the season where you can really feel the series leaning into its commercial side. The show is beginning to acknowledge the end of its premise in this season as well. If Sabrina's magic was a metaphor for becoming a woman, and the series was about learning how to wield that new power, the idea of her needing a protege seems to suggest that she's at least good enough to teach others, like Dreama. And the only threat to her magic comes from an external source, Brad. It's also kind of weird that Brad is just naturally capable of hunting down and turning witches into mice. It really creates the impression that witches shouldn't be in the mortal realm, or at least shouldn't be using magic in the mortal realm. Not the best development if magic is meant as a metaphor for feminine power. The characters Dreema and Brad don't ever feel fully integrated in the show though. Dreema in particular is really only notable for being a klutz. In comparison, Jenny had a bit more flavor as an outsider and served as something of a guide to Sabrina early on, and Valerie's anxiety made her a good contrast to the increasingly confident Sabrina as she grew to be more comfortable in her own skin. Dreema is just clumsy. Oh, and she also has a cat. I'm pretty sure that's the same cat puppet as the one from Sabrina Down Under, but this is a completely different character. Brad is a bit more interesting as he acts as a third wheel between Harvey and Sabrina, leading to some jealousy. And in Ice Station Sabrina, he nearly figures out her secret. Hey, what are those sparks? Static electricity? No way, it came out of your finger. Hey, Brad, look out! It wasn't a miracle. It was like... like magic. Like Sabrina has some sort of magical powers. Shh. Sabrina Spellman, you are a... What's that light? It's the moon. Guess the weather's clearing up. What was I about to say? Dreema and Brad's roles come to a head when Brad figures out Dreema is a witch and she is turned into a mouse in the episode Dreema the Mouse. But by the time that one wraps up, Dreema is back to normal and Brad has his witch hunter gene removed with some help from Zelda. The witch hunter gene is a tiny pair of blue jeans? <laughs> Quick, drop them in the acid wash. The fourth season also saw Sabrina's aunts go through some changes. Zelda is dating Mr. Kraft and Hilda opens up a clock shop, complete with a magic clock that lets people travel through time. If it sounds like a lot is going on in the season, that's because it is. I haven't even gotten to the biggest change of the season, and that's the arrival of Josh in the episode titled Episode 81, The Phantom Menace. Josh Blackheart is played by David Lasher. Lasher had previously played Ted McGriff on the Nickelodeon series Hey Dude, and Vinny Ponitardi on the NBC series Blossom. Josh is the manager of a coffee shop Sabrina gets a part-time job at and serves as another potential love interest, threatening the Sabrina-Harvey relationship. Josh and Sabrina are immediately into one another. Your boss, Josh, he's great. Yeah, there's just one thing that bothers me about him. What? I have a huge crush on him. And disastrously, in the episode Prelude to a Kiss, after Sabrina blows off Harvey to hang out with Josh, things take an awful turn. Thanks for helping me study. You're welcome. And maybe someday you can admit I'm right about the goat thing. <laughs> you don't look sick to me. 
After this moment, we see Sabrina and Harvey split again. She briefly dates Josh, but they decide to stay friends. And in the episode, love means having to say you're sorry. After Sabrina tries to fix things with Harvey using magic, she instead takes a more direct approach. Oh, sorry. Are you sorry? Yes, very. I'm so glad to hear you say that. I'm so glad to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't say I was sorry sooner. You know, I thought I couldn't forgive you, but sometimes I feel like I'm under your spell. I guess sometimes the mortal way is the magic way. What? The history Sabrina and Harvey share is strong enough to get them back together, and this ending is very cute. This little arc was also a very nice boost to the show's ratings, which we're starting to dip at this point. So this is probably part of the reason why we're going to be seeing more of Josh in the future. And he's still very much into Sabrina. Taking a step away from all of this, it should be very clear how busy this show was getting. This season spent a lot of time on this love triangle, and that was balanced against the new characters getting up to their own mischief, Sabrina's aunts having adventures of their own, all the while as magic continues to create messy spectacles. As Salem notes in one episode, Looks like the spell went wrong in an unexpected way. How unusual. In the episode, The Wild Wild Witch, we see Sabrina take on an evil version of herself once again as she learns the importance of rules and boundaries. And in The Four Faces of Sabrina, she splits into four versions of herself to try and juggle all her obligations. This is a show that feels like it's in conflict with itself figuring out what it is it wants to say while trying to do multiple things all at once. There are so many little balls up in the air, it's doing everything it can to retain an audience without doing the necessary work to build the strength of the show's core premise. And perhaps it was something of a mixed blessing that it would need to reinvent itself in future seasons. Sabrina needed to grow up, but how would that impact the series itself? What did it mean to be a witch in full charge of your powers in the mortal world? But the series was more interested in keeping the Sabrina train rolling by throwing as many elements as possible into the show to create the impression of a series where a lot of stuff was going on, but not a lot was always being said. It's here we can see an emphasis on continued profits is stretching the show thin. The creatively conservative nature of sitcoms resists changes to the premise, lest audiences be upset by something new and different. By adhering to that tradition, Sabrina the Teenage Witch was upholding an old norm that wasn't suited to this show's narrative. Trying to tell a story of an endlessly teenage witch, never ready to be part of the wider world, everyone at some point grows up. But there was pressure to keep things in that same place so the show could continue making a profit. The reality of that stasis reflects how this symbol of feminism is being restricted by the need to turn in a reliable profit. Although come season 5 there would be a massive transformation to the show, this was one that was perhaps less dictated by the show's original premise and more by its need to make a lot of money. Before the season ends, Dreama and Brad would both exit the series. And sadly, after three seasons, Mr. Kraft makes his exit as well. <laughs> I am suing you, cat. For the finale of season four, titled The End of an Era, the love triangle rears its head once more as both Josh and Harvey compete for Sabrina at her request. When Harvey declares Sabrina getting saved is most important, the two of them work together to save her. We did it! All right! <laughs> wow, you must work out. Uh, you know, I've been benching. Guys, this stuff ain't slow sand! Sabrina then finds out that Harvey has reached his quota for spells and that her magic no longer works on him. And Harvey isn't quite as slow on the uptake as he usually is. Sabrina, can we talk about the fact that you're a witch? Now's that for a cliffhanger. The series really puts itself in an interesting place here. If the character and premise of Sabrina the Teenage Witch has run its course, dealing with the idea of her mortal boyfriend knowing the truth moves things forward in an interesting way. Before, Sabrina only had other witches she could confine in. How would Harvey deal with having a girlfriend who was a witch? How would Sabrina introduce that part of her life to him? And could this be the symbolic reconciliation between a guy from a world shaped by men learning how to live with a witch expressing a feminine power that had been chased out of that world? Sabrina the Teenage Witch would approach those questions, though it would do so without Harvey. At least not full time. As this season saw Nate Richard leave the show's principal cast and take the character of Harvey with him. Though luckily, this was not the last we would see of Mr. Kinkle. And let's close this discussion of season four with Salem pretending to be a firefighter. Oopsie. You did that on purpose. I think the oopsie implies that I did. <laughs> there were massive changes to Sabrina the Teenage Witch ahead of its fifth season. 
For one, it would be moving to a new network. While negotiating the future of the series with ABC, the owner of the show, Viacom, was looking to get an increase on the reported $1 million that ABC was currently pairing for the series per episode. It was reported in Variety that the initial offer from ABC was somewhere around $1.2 million per episode, though that was rejected by Viacom and their parent company, Paramount. As negotiations went on, it seemed like ABC was walking away from the show entirely, possibly because they were currently rethinking their TGIF lineup, as Sabrina was the only show that night with particularly strong numbers. The once important block was no longer the powerhouse it had originally been. The WB network came in with a much lower per episode offer of $675,000 per episode, although it was offering to pick up the show for two years instead of one. And the promise of an additional season would mean even more money for Viacom slash Paramount when they sell the show into syndication. Several months after their first offer of $1.2 million per episode, ABC came back with a much lower offer of $975,000 per episode. This sealed Sabrina's move over to the WB. The move to a different network brought with it some less than kind words from Melissa Joan Hart. This is from an excerpt in an Entertainment Weekly article where she's interviewed. Now that TGIF is gone and Millionaire has taken over the whole freaky network, it'll be a nice fresh start, says star Melissa Joan Hart, who ascribes ABC's not-so-benign neglect of the series to the 1996 replacement of President and Sabrina Champion, Ted Harbert with Jamie Tarsus. She steps in and she doesn't give a shit. You know, two guys, a girl, and a pizza place. Let's promote the hell out of that. In that same article, Paula Hart, the show's executive producer, also spoke to how the series would be changing. It gives us the opportunity to be a little edgy, although I will not abandon the audience that we've built. Sabrina's never going to talk about sex, and she's not going to have a drug problem. In another interview with Deseret, Paul Hart also signaled that while the network change offered the chance to evolve the show, this was something they were already considering. You get tired of doing the same thing all the time. No matter where we went, we were going to make these changes. Melissa Joan Hart echoed this, saying, The show is changing. The network is changing. It's almost going to be like doing a whole new show for us, except we get to work with the same people we love. And we have such a great fan base, so why let them down? And so the show had its most radical makeover heading into Sabrina's college years. Maybe you just need a little push? <laughs> Season 5 opens with Sabrina in therapy dealing with the fact that Harvey has broken up with her, apparently unable to handle Sabrina being a witch, so that's one cliffhanger resolved. Salem is taking it particularly hard. Harvey was my best friend, my soulmate. Yet to him, you are nothing but a cat. <laughs> when Sabrina goes to her new school, Adams College, she decides to live closer to campus, which means moving in with some other students, and so we're introduced to three new characters. Roxy King, played by Soleil Moon Fry, shares a room with Sabrina. At this point, Fry is probably most known for having been the star of Punky Brewster, and behind the scenes, she was very good friends with Melissa Joan Hart. Roxy is a bit standoffish at first, but her brash personality is a nice counterpoint to the more soft-spoken Sabrina. Look. You seem very nice. Thanks. I have no room in my life for people like that. Morgan Cavanaugh, played by Elisa Donovan, is the RA for this dorm. Before joining Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Donovan was easily most recognizable from the movie Clueless, where she played Cher's nemesis, Amber. Morgan is the superficial airhead who gradually finds her way into Sabrina's heart. Before you go, I have a quick question. Oh, I don't have time for questions. Wait, but I thought you said you were here for me 24 hours. Not in the same day. <laughs> the last person living in their home is Miles Goodman, played by Trevor Lasauer. Lasauer had a number of roles before Miles, but this would be his first major job. Miles is the slightly neurotic conspiracy theorist whose wacky theories never seem to consider Sabrina's supernatural nature. But our universe is inhabited by other forces and other beings. Oh, you mean like witches? Witches? Come on. They're about as real as the Easter Bunny and the Lone Gunman theory. <laughs> Although Sabrina wouldn't be living with them anymore, Hilda and Zelda are still very much part of the series. Zelda takes a job at Adams teaching physics. Hilda buys the coffee shop Sabrina is still working at alongside Josh. And yes, even though Harvey is gone, Josh is still around, swooping in to fill the void left in Sabrina's heart. As for Salem, he's still around, splitting his time between Sabrina's dorm room and Hilda and Zelda's house. A big part of Sabrina the Teenage Witch moving forward was Sabrina stepping into adulthood, dropping the teenage part of her title. Although the show would still be officially called Sabrina the Teenage Witch, it was often shortened to Sabrina in ads. 
first, it's Sabrina, and check out the new look on Cisco. One of the themes of the early seasons was the power of sisterhood, from Sabrina's aunts as role models to Sabrina learning she's part of a whole world of witches. And in these later seasons, we see a number of complications that undermine that reading. Hilda and Zelda are still fixtures in the series, and Sabrina still very much needs them. As seen in the second episode of the season, Double Time, after once again bailing out Sabrina from another spell gone awry. Thank you guys for helping them out, and for getting me out of this mess, and for not gloating much. In spite of that moment, Hilda and Zelda don't have a ton to do in these seasons when it comes to helping out Sabrina. We get the odd episode focusing on one of their stories, though usually they're self-contained. It's not so much that they're crucial parts of Sabrina's life anymore, as they are just having adventures alongside her now. When Sabrina strikes out on her own, she starts to learn that the world isn't quite as simple as what she experienced back at Westbridge High. Her first major encounter with Injustice is in the episode House of Pies, where as inspiring journalists, Sabrina and Roxy team up to uncover the seedy underbelly of the Moo Pie sorority. They find out that the more senior members of the sorority are forcing the more junior ones to do their homework for them. How precious. We all get together and do our homework. Oh, not quite. We all get together and do the seniors' homework. What? Isn't that cheating? If you don't do it, you don't get into Moo Pie. While this seems like an easy scoop at first, Sabrina has second thoughts when she considers the consequences of running with this story. Roxy, we have to consider the ramifications. These girls could get thrown out of school, then their parents may never talk to them again, and then what's gonna happen to the kids? I mean, you saw Girl Interrupted. Murder, mayhem, a major box office disappointment. I'm sure there's a valid point in there somewhere. On the other hand, if we want to be responsible journalists, we have to be willing to make the tough calls. Eventually, the Boston Times scoops them and the story gets out there, well before Sabrina realized that she has an obligation to the truth. The episode raises some interesting questions regarding ethics and journalism and considering the impact of a story. It lands on the side of ensuring the stories of victims are considered ahead of those victimizing them, but it importantly raises the point that those victimizers shouldn't be made inhuman foes to be punished without any concern for their well-being, and that being a responsible journalist is considering the consequences of your reporting. In contrast to this, we see Sabrina break a story in the episode, Making the Grade, where she learns that teachers have been giving students on the baseball team easy grades to ensure they can play in the upcoming championship game. Oh, well, isn't it the purpose of good journalism? To shine a light on important issues and make people think? Exactly. And rumor has it the school is going to crack down on preferential grading practices. Oh, that's great! The school's crackdown hits hard, and it looks like the baseball team is going to be missing a few of its key players ahead of the upcoming championship game. Sabrina takes it on herself to help one of the baseball players impacted by the new policy, personally tutoring him. This seems like an extreme step to take. While it's certainly nice of Sabrina to step in, her article exposing the broken grading system isn't the problem, it's the system that's flawed here. The symbolism here is important. In the first episode, Sabrina nearly takes down a corrupt sorority, and while she struggles with the consequences of what her potential story might have done, she never considers having to step up to care for those affected. One of the pledges to the sorority was talking about the importance of making friends and connecting with other women in that space, but Sabrina doesn't do anything to help this girl once the sorority is taken down. In the second episode, she bends over backwards, personally tutoring one of the athletes on the boys' baseball team impacted by her reporting, so that he won't be impacted by any negative consequences from a school that was letting him coast by with inflated grades. In both cases, it's an institution that lets people down, but only in the latter case does Sabrina feel obliged to make amends, and it's telling that the amends she's making isn't to the girls burned by the sorority, but rather the boys' baseball team. This isn't quite the show about female solidarity it once was. In Sabrina the Activist, Sabrina's more political sides comes to the fore when she steps up to help some historic buildings from being torn down. The story becomes even more important when she learns that people inside the buildings are being evicted with no place to go to. Sabrina does some pretty good activism here, continuously putting pressure on the school administration, and she even gets a surprising win when the people being displaced are offered new homes. Adams College is prepared to compensate the tenants by providing housing in the Candor Arms a new residential community on the other side of the campus. Sabrina is disappointed that old buildings will be coming down, but the fact that no one is losing their homes is, in some ways, a much bigger deal. At the end of the episode, Sabrina is strangely almost bitter, as if the compromise wasn't worth it. But Josh raises an important point. Sabrina, this wasn't about a building. It was about people. You said so yourself. And they're happy. I don't think they feel like they're settling. Sabrina should reflect not just on her wind here, but also her priorities. Saving a historic building is a lovely thing to do, but the material needs of dozens of people is more important. And perhaps what Sabrina should be thinking about here is that the next time she wants to use her political muscle, she should be less concerned with protecting a historic building, and instead focus on a group of people who need a witch on their side. 
Sabrina's life as a journalist eventually takes her to the Boston Citizen, a fictional newspaper, where she's given an internship. Though we don't see quite as much of the activist spirit we saw in earlier episodes once she takes up this role. And in season 7, she slips further away from making a difference with her journalism. And in the context of the series, Sabrina was often far more preoccupied with her romantic trauma. With Harvey out of the picture, Josh is free to pursue Sabrina unopposed. Although it takes most of the fifth season to get there, we see Sabrina move past her heartbreak over Harvey and move towards the more available Josh. Just because I didn't like how you handled things with Brett doesn't mean that we shouldn't be friends. I mean, we still have to work together, so we should figure out a way to get along so Well, that's one way. <laughs> Although leading up to this, we did get a few cameos from Harvey that suggest he isn't gone entirely. Harvey has a few more guest appearances in season five, and he and Sabrina at least talk about the finale to season four. You've always been a really good friend to me, and the reason I'm calling is that I want to apologize. Thanks. That really means a lot to me. When the show's sixth season rolls around, Sabrina and Josh are officially a couple, just in time for Harvey to return to the principal cast. While Sabrina sticks with Josh throughout the season, you can't help but feel the series is building a case for Harvey. Often he's instrumental to helping Sabrina out of a few pinches, like in Deliver Us From Email, where Harvey figures out Sabrina is under a spell. I think Sabrina's under some kind of spell. She's acting really weird. Define weird. <laughs> All this jealousy in the air does eventually lead to an interesting episode titled Sabrina and the Kiss, when a guy she briefly dated, Derek, played by Brian Kirkwood, tries to make a move on Sabrina. Derek, you have so much depth. What are you doing? I thought I felt some little electricity between us. You know me, I'm passionate. I like to grab the moment. Yeah, I'm passionate. I like to grab my boyfriend, Josh. The kiss came out of absolutely nowhere. I immediately pushed him away, told him that he was out of line and that you and I are totally together. It meant absolutely nothing. You have to believe me. I do believe you. You do? When Josh doesn't fly into a rage, Sabrina goes on an ill-advised quest to fuel his jealousy. The episode ends with a few interesting lines. Many times people mistake jealousy and insecurity for passion, but true love is built on trust and mutual respect. That's a lovely statement about relationships, and one that anyone should take to heart. But one strange thing about this episode is the use of Derek, a one-off character from the previous season. Why use Derek when so much of this season features Josh being jealous about Harvey? It doesn't undermine Josh's chill response in this episode to see him get upset about Harvey, but it also shows he's more realistic about what might actually interfere in the relationship. Had Harvey made a move, it also would have made his character seem less sweet and innocent, two major parts of his personality that he's held onto for the past six seasons. If we contrast how Josh was okay with Derek, but not so okay with Harvey, it reveals that there is an element of trust missing from Josh when it comes to Harvey and Sabrina. In the season 6 finale, I Fall to Pieces, Hilda falls for a guy named Will and is suddenly engaged to be married. Zelda and Sabrina have misgivings and they try to expose Will as a fraud, and when they drive him away, Hilda falls to pieces, revealing that Will was truly her soulmate. Apparently when a witch finds true love and they leave, that's what happens. To make things right, Sabrina needs to gamble her true love to bring back Hilda, possibly losing that love forever. Hilda! I brought you back to life! Sure, if it makes you feel better. So needy. It works, and Hilda is happily married. At the end of the episode, though, we see the consequences for Sabrina's risk. Sabrina, I've got something to tell you. I'm still in love with you, but I know it'll never be returned, so I'm moving to California. What? Sabrina, I don't know what just came over me, but I can't ever see you again. I'm taking that newspaper job in Prague. What? Well, it was nice meeting you. Guess I'll never see you again. What? Goodbye. So who was Sabrina's soulmate? Harvey? Josh? The cake guy? The next season, we'll answer that question, though in the meantime, we're left wondering when the show became so strictly about Sabrina's love life. Her dating Harvey was always part of the early seasons, but it wasn't until the appearance of Josh that things got much more romantically focused. And while this is an interesting dynamic, it often feels emphasized in a way the other parts of Sabrina's life aren't. Sabrina's friendship with Roxy, Miles, and Morgan are nice, though they don't quite have the same appeal, and her career as a journalist becomes less interesting as it often focuses on the antics of fitting into office life. Also, her work life includes Josh, as he's a photographer for the newspaper, and working alongside Josh at the newspaper grounds that setting a little too close to her relationship drama. 
Outside of that romance, Sabrina's stories feel very ordinary, and she doesn't have the same outsider status she did in high school. Attending Adams freed her from the confines of high school, and working at a newspaper let her show off her talents. There was no Libby or Mr. Kraft to clamp down on her unjustly. So if a witch is a symbol of rebellion against the status quo, what is there to rebel against? And with the witch elements of Sabrina's life being muted, it seems like the way she gets along in the system is by hiding the symbol of her feminine power, and the mortal world lets her be. And she's agreed to that so she can fit in, which is kinda sad. The departures for the season offer a subtle hint of the future of Sabrina's romantic life, since the finale marks the final appearance of Josh as David Lasher exited the show. If anything should ever happen, we can't be together. I'll always love you. Can you check off that visor? What are you talking about? Are you okay? I'm fine. It just, you never know what's gonna happen. Also leaving was Miles, though he was never quite in the running for Sabrina's soulmate. We don't really get an explanation for why he left, he's just gone. Full house, ace is high. <sighs> okay, now the cat is singing and dancing. <laughs> Most emotionally though, the sixth season also saw the exit of Sabrina's Aunt Zelda and Aunt Hilda. I'll never forget when we skied on Mars, or when we rode the roller coaster on the rings of Saturn, or when you rescued me from the volcano, or when you took me in and raised me like I was your own daughter. <laughs> this is probably the saddest goodbye of the series. Hilda and Zelda were a big part of what made the show work, and while their roles in seasons 5 and 6 seemed less important, they still very much leave a hole with their absence. A hole season 7 would struggle to fill. And before we leave these seasons, I gift you all with Salem in a Tux. Well, my parents let me use magic anytime I want, and I don't even have to ask. The success of Sabrina the Teenage Witch naturally raised the question of a spin-off. Although none of the Archie Comics crew seemed to be in consideration at the time, there were two different attempts to launch spin-offs starring Emily Hart, Melissa Joan Hart's younger sister. On Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Emily played Sabrina's cousin Amanda, a troublesome young witch who often vexed and hexed Sabrina. Amanda would appear in at least one episode in each season of Sabrina the Teenage Witch. In the Season 3 episode, Sabrina the Matchmaker, we had our first attempt at a spin-off. In this episode, Marigold, played by Haley Todd, falls for a mortal plumber and meal, played by Brian Cousins. Marigold gives away her powers to be with him, creating a large blended family, Emile with his three mortal sons, and Marigold with her two witch daughters. Amanda's sister, Allie, was played by Alexandra Hart Gilliams, Melissa and Emily's younger sister. Plunger Boy's going down. <laughs> Way down. Although this series never did come to pass, interestingly, the biggest winner here was Frankie Munez, who played Angelo, one of Emile's sons. This episode aired in February of 1999, and less than a year later, Munez would be starring in Malcolm in the Middle. Had this Sabrina spinoff been picked up, it's possible Munez never would have played Malcolm, so this pilot not working out was a blessing in disguise for him. In Season 5's Witch Right Hall, we got another spinoff attempt with Amanda being sent to live in the mortal realm for a year at a special school called Witch Right Hall, a school for wayward witches who need a firmer hand in their upbringing. The pilot introduced a number of characters that would have been a part of this production, though personally I was only charmed by the gym teacher, a talking dog voiced by Blake Clark. Do we have any beer nuts? Clark would play the talking dog Phil in a season 6 episode of Sabrina, possibly because they didn't want to let all that expensive talking dog technology go to waste. The pilot didn't fly, in spite of having a much better premise than the first one, although it was around the time of the first Harry Potter movie, that didn't quite rub off enough to make this series a success. 12.36 on the dot. Season 7 brought Sabrina to a whole new dynamic, but first it had some cleaning up to do after last season. Hilda had left Sabrina to live a life of wedded bliss, but there was still the matter of Zelda, since both Caroline Ray and Beth Broderick had left the series. We open with Sabrina being reassembled and very quickly resolving everything. How did we get put back together? I did it. And Zelda? You gave up your adult years for me? I know it might be a little strange having an eight-year-old look after you. Zelda, you don't have to look after me anymore. You and Aunt Hilda have taught me everything I need to know. Now I need to prove that I can get by without relying on you guys. Although Sabrina had to risk her true love to bring back Hilda when she shattered, apparently Zelda can exchange her adult years to bring back Sabrina. It doesn't make much sense, but it very conveniently resolves everything from the finale and lets the show move on. Also, there's a talking cat. Did I mention the show has a talking cat? That's what they would say behind the scenes whenever there were issues with continuity or there were strange plot twists that perhaps didn't make the most sense. They would just remind everyone, this is the show with a talking cat. The series jumps forward in time and now Sabrina is living in her aunt's house with Roxy and Morgan. 
And Sabrina is looking to get a new job with Scorch Magazine, a hip millennial outlet that covers the entertainment industry. A fun bit of trivia for this episode is that we see Sabrina interview the band Course of Nature, which included Mark Wilkerson, Melissa Joan Hart's future husband. Early in the season, we were also introduced to Sabrina's co-workers, Diana Maria Riva as Annie Martos, Andrew Walker as Cole Harper, Bumper Robinson as James, and John Ducey as Leonard. Sabrina joining Scorch seems like an odd move. Though her more political side seemed to fade after college, she still worked as an intern at a more news-centric outlet. To move into entertainment in what looks to be an analog to the most tedious type of millennial rags seems like a weird choice. It's framed as her having few job choices, with journalism being a very tough industry to survive in, which is depressingly realistic. The Scorch magazine crew and Sabrina's role there don't have the charm of the series perhaps expected it to. As the season went along, they seemed to be less a part of the series, until 14 episodes in, Sabrina literally calls it quits in the episode Present Perfect. Do you know how difficult it is to find a job in journalism? You're making a huge mistake. Yeah, I don't think so. But if I am, I'll learn. This episode was centered around Sabrina learning from mistakes, which subtly suggests that the whole Scorch Magazine plotline was a mistake. Although there wouldn't be much time to learn from it, since the series was very much approaching its conclusion. And perhaps that's the real reason to cut this plotline so short. The series was ending, and they had another story they wanted to tell. Before moving on though, I do want to highlight something interesting about Sabrina the Teenage Witch. You're probably familiar with the very special episode, Cliché and Sitcoms, where we get overly dramatic, sometimes sappy episodes from an otherwise lighthearted series. Typically, these episodes touch on more serious issues, like death, sex, drug addiction, and other sorts of weighty topics. Sabrina the Teenage Witch didn't really have those episodes, or rather, when they did touch on serious topics, it was always done through the lens of the witch world. Melissa Joan Hart remarked on this in her book, writing, One of my favorite things about the show is that we never pandered to viewers with a very special Sabrina episode. We didn't get into tough topics unless it was through a silly lens, since the show's purpose was to entertain, not preach or teach. As an example, in a season 3 episode, we see Sabrina deal with addiction when she eats some pancakes and becomes hopelessly addicted. Apparently all witches become addicted to pancakes when they eat them. This episode is titled Pancake Madness, a play on the infamous anti-marijuana movie Reefer Madness. We had another version of this in the episode Cloud 10, where the drug addiction analog gets particularly highlighted when Sabrina takes a trip to Cloud 10 to mellow out. Here are some of the episode's many references to drug culture. I've got four freckles on the back of my hand. Why? Wow, that is deep. No, I'm glad you enjoyed the trip, but it's time for you to go back. But this time, I'm gonna have to charge you. We also see Sabrina deal with body image issues in the episode Now You See Her, Now You Don't, where Sabrina turns herself invisible when she tries to use magic to fit into a dress. What are you talking about? It's like looking at a picture of William Howard Taft! <laughs> All this dieting has affected you psychologically. You can't see that you're so thin, you're practically sick. I wonder if that last milkshake made any difference. I certainly feel lighter. Salem, help! I've disappeared! We even get a few looks at racism when Sabrina dates a witch who's anti-mortal in the episode Some of My Best Friends Are Half Mortals. What do you call a mortal with half of a brain? Gifted. <laughs> <laughs> Love that joke, man. So I guess you just stay with cutie there until something better comes along, huh? Hey, it is not easy to find a full witch in the mortal realm. Sometimes you gotta settle. <laughs> settle? We also saw something like this earlier in the episode, Witch Trash, where some of Sabrina's witch relatives also reveal they have an anti-mortal bias. So tell us what it's like living in Hong Kong. What is your little mortal friend talking about? Mortal! I ain't sitting next to it. Mortal? So there's a lengthy record of Sabrina the Teenage Witch tackling serious topics, albeit always through the lens of the witch world, very much undercutting some of the real-world sting of these topics. These episodes raise a question that's always worth asking about a piece of media. Who are these episodes for? Presumably the younger audience the show courted didn't need to be preached to in a heavy-handed way, but how clearly do these messages come across? While some come in pretty clear, with episodes like Cloud 10 being incredibly obvious, there's something a bit odd about these topics not having their usual power or gravity. It's strange to see Sabrina dealing with a body image crisis and treating it at the same level of seriousness as her freaking out that she got a C on an assignment. On the other hand, anyone watching TV on Friday night, on TGIF specifically, got more than their share of very special episodes on other shows that got incredibly heavy. Check out my video on Boy Meets World if you'd like an idea of how serious that show got. 
Funnily enough, both Sabrina the Teenage Witch and Boy Meets World featured episodes where a character ends up joining a cult, and the less serious tone made the Sabrina episode seem more fitting. Perhaps because a cult is really heavy for a family-friendly sitcom, so going silly made it a lot more palatable. That might be the strength of the rare times Sabrina took on heavier topics, though. By handling them differently compared to other sitcoms, they stood out a bit more. They were able to make their point without it feeling like an unnatural departure from the series' usual aesthetic. Sabrina's Pancake Addiction is one of the more popular episodes in the series and is Melissa Joan Hart's personal favorite. Noticeably absent from these heavier topics, and deliberately so, is any discussion of sex. It's a bit strange that Sabrina goes through high school and college without once talking about it in a serious way. While that might have made sense for very young audiences who perhaps aren't quite ready for a sex talk just yet, but if audiences were growing with the show, seven years seems like enough time to finally have that sex talk. Instead, we have Sabrina do nothing more than share a few smooches with guys she's dating, and that's about it. Halfway through season seven, we got the last person to join the principal cast of the series, Dylan Neal playing Sabrina's new love interest, Aaron Jacobs. He first appeared in the episode, Sabrina in Wonderland. I'm not the kind of girl you should be running after. Hey. Then stop running. They're immediately into one another, and this will be the plotline that takes the series to its finale. The end of the series likely wasn't a huge surprise for Melissa Joan Hart and the rest of the cast. Though the original deal with the WB was for two seasons, its fifth and sixth, each season being 22 episodes apiece, the network only ordered 13 episodes for the show's seventh season. It did renew it for another nine, giving it that full 22 episode run in November of that year, but that was well into the season's run. Speaking to TV Guide Online, Melissa Joan Hart said, It's a pretty crappy way to treat a show as old as we are, but it happens. She said that the WB wasn't completely invested in the series because of its cost and its roots being from ABC. She added, Because nobody there backs our show, nobody there is fully supporting it or putting their neck out for it. According to an E! Online article, Sabrina's ratings were getting really bad. It reads, Last week, a rerun of Sabrina was the week's least watched show on the six major broadcast networks, placing in 121st place with 1.6 million viewers. Not a good thing, even by the WB standards. For the season to date, the show ranks 156th among total viewers, averaging a little more than 3 million sets of eyeballs. Before its relocation to Thursdays, Sabrina was conjuring 3.4 million viewers, up from the 3.1 million it averaged during the 2001-2002 season. With some awareness that the show was coming to an end, Sabrina's romance with Aaron would be the vehicle to get them to the finish line. Just stay for the late show. I mean, not that I'm implying anything. Not that I'm not implying anything. I just... Please say something. <laughs> so, seen any good movies? In spite of that awkwardness, the two start getting more serious. Though Sabrina does have to reckon with the fact that Harvey still has feelings for her. In Cirque du Sabrina, Sabrina learns that Harvey is still carrying a photo in his wallet from the time they were together. That was a long time ago. I know. Look, I, I know we broke up a while ago, but to be honest, my feelings for you never really changed. The show starts to get a bit more interesting here, possibly because of the first half of the season focusing on Scorch, which wasn't too compelling, but Harvey always did seem like the guy in Sabrina's life to root for, partially because he's been there since the beginning, but he's also a very genuine sweet guy. While the audience is left wondering what will become of Harvey, Sabrina gets closer to Aaron. First they say they love each other, and then in Romance Looming, Aaron proposes. Sabrina, will you- Yes! Wait for me to finish? <laughs> Sorry, right. Right. Please go on. Sabrina, will you marry me? Yes! I feel like I have to mention that this is about four episodes after Aaron first appears, so this relationship is very much in Fast Forward. In Spellmanian Slip, we see a really interesting metaphor where Sabrina travels inside her own heart to see the space Aaron occupies, only to realize his little pedestal isn't nearly as big as the room Harvey has. Sabrina, still determined to make things work, builds a room for Aaron. It's a nice bit of visual storytelling revealing how you always carry old loves in your heart and that sometimes the place a first love can hold is a special one. But Sabrina refuses to consider that perhaps it isn't just her memories keeping Harvey in that space. In the episode A Fish Tale, Sabrina's Aunt Irma, played by Barbara Eden, arrives and turns Aaron into a fish. Aunt Irma doesn't approve of Sabrina marrying a mortal. To prove how much she loves Aaron, Sabrina gives up her magic to marry him. Irma decides to give Harvey Sabrina's magic, Irma having been charmed by Harvey in an earlier episode. But even with all that magic, Harvey uses it to bring back Aaron. Harvey changed Aaron back? 
Why couldn't I do that? Well, you were trying to undo my spell. He was trying to make you happy. Turns out his was a much more powerful motive. Unable to watch Sabrina get married, Harvey decides to go, leaving behind Sabrina's magic. May your life be filled with happiness and with the magic only you can create. I'll always love you, Harvey. And that's where things stand heading into the final episode, Soulmates. With the wedding here, Sabrina has a case of cold feet, but luckily she's not facing this wedding alone as she has her friends and the return of Aunt Hilda and Aunt Zelda. Well, mostly Hilda. We don't already have one. Sabrina's parents and her cousin Amanda also arrive. Sabrina is able to see her mother because Hilda snuck her into the ceremony as a llama. Also, Zelda was turned into a candle to make up for it. The still nervous Sabrina goes to the North Star to see if she and Aaron are truly soulmates by putting together their soul stones. They fit! They fit! Almost. Something else seems to be going on when Amanda mysteriously vanishes for a bit. Wait, where's Amanda? Hey, oh. Sorry, I'm late. I had some business to take care of. Aaron manages to calm Sabrina down, and she gets ready to walk down the aisle when she notices something. I can't wear this. Get it off me. Hurry. 1236. Oh, Harvey gave me that seven years ago. 1236 is the exact time that we met. You might remember that from all the way back in season one. 1236? That's what time it was when we first spoke. Sabrina runs out on the ceremony, and her mother, played by Allie Mills, offers some advice. So two pieces of glowing coal don't fit together. Who cares? What matters is what's in your heart. No magic can tell you that. They restart the ceremony again, and Sabrina finally tells Aaron that she doesn't think they're soulmates. If we're not soulmates, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Never think that almost is good enough for you. Or for you. And outside we find Harvey holding a soul stone that Amanda had left for him. I'm not really sure what this is, but something tells me I'll find the answer here. And I think I just found mine. Although everyone tells Sabrina she needs to look into her heart, and that helped her realize Aaron wasn't the guide for her, there's no denying that a little magic helped bring Harvey to the church that day. After all, it was Amanda who gave him the soul stone that brought him back. Magic isn't something that we should let run our lives for us, but it is something that's still integral to our happiness. It wasn't magic that helped Sabrina realize that Aaron wasn't the guy for her, but it did help reunite her with Harvey. It reveals that perhaps there is a place in the mortal world for magic after all. And even though magic isn't something we should let run our lives for us, when it comes to love, shouldn't it always be a little magical? The ending with Sabrina and Harvey riding off into the sunset is a sweet fantasy. Imagining that your first love will be your last one and that fate will guide you to who you need to be with. It frames this entire series as Sabrina's journey to Harvey. It doesn't matter how many dates she went on, at the end of the day, Sabrina and Harvey were the OTP. The end of Sabrina the Teenage Witch was not the end of Sabrina Spellman. Sabrina did take a break from appearing on television, but the third volume of her comic continued until 2009. Sabrina also saw a return to television with the 2013 animated CGI, Sabrina, Secrets of a Teenage Witch, which ran for a single season. In 2013, a comic series titled Afterlife with Archie came out that created a horror-themed version of the classic Archie characters. The success of that led to another title, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, giving us a grittier version of Sabrina the Teenage Witch. In 2015, there was some big stuff happening with Archie comics, with a relaunch of the whole line that included a more modern take on the characters. Chilling Adventures of Sabrina was included as part of the Archie horror imprint. This new vision of Archie comics helped set the stage for the TV series Riverdale on the CW. Riverdale proved so popular that it raised the obvious question of when we'd be seeing Sabrina return to the television screen. And in 2018, we finally had Sabrina's return in the Netflix series Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, starring Kiernan Shipka as Sabrina. This was a very sharp departure from the 90s sitcom, adopting a much darker tone with more sex and violence, and a much stronger horror vibe to it. In its final episodes, it included very fun cameos from Beth Broderick and Caroline Ray, playing aunts Zelda and Hilda from Another Reality. A fun extra was produced ahead of the release of this series where members of the 90s sitcom cast watched small clips of the show ahead of its release. Their reactions were pretty fun. We would have never allowed Sabrina to behave that way. I like her though, she's very political, little Sabrina. Chilling Adventures of Sabrina lasted for two seasons, split into four parts, before coming to a sudden end. Though Sabrina went on to appear in a few episodes of Riverdale to wrap up her story. 
Since then, we have yet to see Sabrina appear on screen in any fashion, though the 90s show still enjoys some popularity, with cast members appearing at live convention panels, including 90s Con. Following the end of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Melissa Joan Hart took some time off from acting to instead focus on directing, though she would return to the world of sitcoms to star in the 2010 series Melissa and Joey, alongside Joey Lawrence. There were a number of fun Sabrina reunions on several episodes of Melissa and Joey. But now it's time you knew the truth. Mel Burke, you are a great and powerful witch. One lesser known cameo on the show was that in a Halloween episode, one of the black cats to appear was the last surviving Salem. I want you to be the most realistic cat there ever was! Oh my god, what did you do to me? We also saw Melissa reunite with Salem in a cute Funny or Die sketch where she gives us Sabrina's opinion on Harry Potter. Spelliamus! And there have been other fun Sabrina-themed cameos on TV programs throughout the years. Melissa Joan Hart has also made appearances on The Masked Singer, where she was a lamp, and she is one of only four people to win $1 million on Wheel of Fortune. Although unlike the other winners who kept the money, her winnings went to the Youth Village's charity. Most recently, Hart was in the news because she was present during a 2023 school shooting in Nashville, where she lives. She was driving nearby and helped assist getting the kids to safety. Since then, she's become a voice to speak out against gun violence in the United States. After she left Sabrina, Caroline Ray went on to host her own talk show, The Caroline Ray Show, and she voiced the role of Linda Flynn Fletcher on the animated series Phineas and Ferb. Over the years, she appeared in a number of other TV shows and movies, occasionally taking on hosting duties for several different game shows and variety programs. Most recently, Caroline Ray appeared in the sitcom Lopez vs. Lopez. Beth Broderick has appeared on a number of different TV shows and movies following Sabrina, with reoccurring roles on Lost and Under the Dome. She's also been in several Christmas-themed movies on both the Hallmark and Lifetime channels. She also continues to perform on stage, recently performing in Chicago in a one-woman show called Bad Dates. Nate Richard acted in a few roles following the end of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, though none were quite as big as the role of Harvey Kinkel. Afterwards, he took some time away from acting to focus on his music career as a singer and songwriter. In 2018, after a story broke about former Cosby star Jeffrey Owens working at Trader Joe's, Richard tweeted out about having to work tough jobs, being a carpenter, janitor, and maintenance man. It was a really nice statement about being an actor on a hit TV show doesn't mean being set for life, and that no one should be made to feel ashamed for taking any job. Nick Bakai left Sabrina the Teenage Witch as a writer early in its run, although he did stick around to play the role of Salem. At the same time, he would voice a number of other characters on other shows. Notably, he was also on The Angry Beavers. He also had reoccurring roles on the TV shows The King of Queens and Till Death. His writing career continued on a number of programs, most notably being an executive producer on the long-running sitcom Mom. He also wrote the Paul Blart Mall Cop movies. And I'm going to have to draw the line here, uncovering the principal cast and what they've been up to post-Sabrina. Apologies if you're a huge fan of one of the other 13 members of the show's ever-changing principal cast. But I'm worried that talking about every single actor here is going to make this video even longer. Young girls turned up in droves to support the series, watching it and eventually taking part in its massive merch empire. The show's creator, Nell Scoville, speaks to the more ideological underpinnings of the series. The show was feminist, and we didn't want to hit anyone over the head with it. But I think with Sabrina, we didn't want to make her a character who cared about clothing and who um, even cared that much about being popular. You know, she wanted to do well in school. She wanted to have her friends. She wanted a nice boyfriend. As the series progressed, we saw a lot of these feminist trappings fade away, though the spectacle did remain, and I think that played some role in the show's decline in popularity. Although, obviously, the biggest drop was a result of changing networks, as the WB simply didn't have the built-in audience ABC did. That aside, it's difficult to imagine what Sabrina the Teenage Witch might have been had it tried to thread that needle of being a voice of female empowerment while feeding the capitalist machine that subjugated and undermines feminine power. Using the symbol of a witch and having a positive family-friendly version of it does carry with it some value. But does Sabrina the Witch do that? Or does it represent the symbol of the witch being co-opted by the capitalist machine, being commodified and turned into a literal product? I think there's a lot to support that reading, but it's not quite as simple and straightforward as that. It's worth returning to that question of who this show is for, and looking at the ratings, we can see it resonated most with young girls. When Sabrina the Teenage Witch debuted, in the advertising, it was playing second banana to Clueless. Comparing Cher, the main character in Clueless, to Sabrina, we see Cher as someone so superficially shaped by culture that she is almost a cliché. 
In Sabrina, we see someone learning about who she is and told that she has the power to make herself who she wants to be. In that light, it's not surprising which story is more appealing to a young girl looking to her future self. While Sabrina the Teenage Witch is, yes, a product of a capitalist system that commodifies everything, that doesn't mean the audience has to play along and consume the product uncritically. As a discerning audience, we can take the good, enjoy the silly, and leave the bad. A symbol can only be claimed by another if you let it stop having power, and witches are all about having lots of magical power. By its seventh season, Sabrina the Teenage Witch was a very different show from where it started. And while most people probably have most affection for those earlier seasons, at the very least the show went out honoring some of the best parts of what made Sabrina the Teenage Witch so special. This idea that a young girl with all this power to shape her own life wouldn't have to hide it or give it up entirely to live in the mortal world. Much of the series feels like Sabrina being brought down to Earth and learning how to live in this mortal world that simply won't accept her for the witch she is, but at least in Harvey, there is an opportunity, a glimmer of hope that perhaps one day, Sabrina won't have to hide who she is and the mortal world will see her and accept her for the witch that she is, just the way Harvey does. Maybe that's what makes the ending feel so special. It carries with it this hope that love can one day change the world. Love, after all, is the most magical thing in the universe. If you sat through this entire lengthy video and are thinking, I'd like to see you talk more about magic cats, Jose. Can you talk more about those? Well, I've got some great news for you because I have a whole podcast you can check out called The Only Warrior Cats Podcast, where I talk about the Warrior Cats books alongside my friends, Zoe B and Lola Sebastian. This podcast has been an absolute blast to make, and I hope you all check it out. It's available on YouTube and wherever you can listen to quality podcasts. Sabrina the Teenage Witch holds a special place in my heart. When I was watching it when it first aired, I have to admit that my young self had a bit of a crush on Melissa Joan Hart. And there's something special about your first crush when you're a young guy still figuring out the world. Watching these episodes again was a fun trip down memory lane. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more of them in the future, I suggest becoming a patron or a member for this channel. Like all these lovely people whose names you see scrolling up the screen, in addition to supporting my work, you'll get early access to videos, your name in the credits, and some fun extras every now and again. If you would like to support this channel in a non-monetary fashion, you can like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and also check out my podcast while you're at it, The Only Warrior Cats Podcast. That would be cool too. Thank you all so much for watching. <laughs>